Yeah, we'll come back to the raccoons in a little bit here for some foreshadowing. Um, anyways, I'm James. Hi, everybody. I'm the uh, company tech lead at Manifold. Uh, we're headquarters in Halifax, but uh, sort of globally distributed. And we build a uh, SaaS marketplace um, where we sell developer tools like databases and stuff. Um, I'm a big fan of cats. I have a large collection of them. I didn't bring any with me today. Um, and mostly through my career, I've been a back-end developer. So this is sort of where I come from with my perspective. You know, I've done some front-end work and sometimes the full stack. Um, and you can find me at those links there. Uh, but, so what we're gonna do today, or this afternoon, is uh, I'm gonna run you through uh, sort of four scenarios of things that have happened to me in real life while writing code. So problems that we are trying to solve, and then the spectacular failures that we experienced, uh, both in how our code failed to do what it was supposed to, and how the world itself failed around us. Um, the excellent and pragmatic solution that we came up for this, and then hopefully a useful lesson that you can take away as well for when you're building your own you know, applications and APIs. Uh, and about this, um, I'm going to assume all responsibility for any problems and take none of the credit for the success of the solution, but I'll keep you know, sort of the, the other parties roughly anonymous for this. Um, so with all that said, uh, the other alternative title for this talk would have been, I have made mistakes so that you won't have to. <laughs> um, anyways, so let's uh, carry along here. Um, so what do I mean when I say, you know, like, what is unreliable? Uh, and there's a lot of things that are unreliable. But uh, when you're writing programs, you can't really rely on much. Uh, Classic example is the network. The network is completely unreliable. Even when you're doing local development, you, know, you can't really depend on that port that you want to use to run your, you know, your database server not already running some other database uh, that you forgot to shut down for you know, the last change you were making. Uh, DNS will fail to resolve. Uh, network connections will terminate early. Network connections will hang indefinitely. Uh, you'll get back responses that, you know, the, the remote server is, is usually will give you a 500 when there's an error and have some nice JSON formatted error message. But sometimes you'll get back HTML because some, something along the way has, you know, been misconfigured and given you the wrong response. Uh, so you can't, even, even for errors, you can't really assume that the, uh, the, what is supposed to be sent will be sent. Storage is unreliable as well, both in sort of the, the physical case and you know in your sort of logical like data storage um, setup. You know, disks will break, systems will slow down as you add more data to them, and it's up to you to sort of deal with all this. And of course, servers are unreliable, even more so now when we're you know everything's in the cloud and it makes it so much more ephemeral. So if you're lucky, you'll get an email from Amazon that tells you that your hardware is degraded, but most likely you're going to get it 30 minutes after that system has already stopped responding. And you'll go and look at monitoring, and it'll say that everything's great, but nothing's working. Software is unreliable, too. Um, you know, you can fix your own software, but you're going to be working with a lot of other systems, libraries, uh, that you only have so much control over. You know, in the case of like that HTML response when you're expecting JSON, you know, this is someone else's software that's not doing what you expect, so you can't rely on it. Uh, you know, you, you can't change other people, but you can change yourself. So in the same way, you may have to change your code to handle weird responses from other things. And we're all unreliable too, right? As developers and as users, uh, we will do things that other developers don't expect. And animals are unreliable as well. So 114 raccoon-related outages reported on cybersquirrel1.com. 
and this is just for raccoons, right? These are major outages of power grids, of communications networks, of services. You go there, you'll see what the raccoons have done, what squirrels, mice, and everything else. You know, it's a, it's, I guess we're at war. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's get into ways that you know I have made mistakes. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, is file transfers. So this is actually a, a pretty old one. Um, like it predates HTML5 file API. Um, so it would have been really cool if this had involved like a nice web UI, but this was a command line tool. Um, but it was backing this uh, sort of on-premises systems management product where you would be able to you know, install this in your data center and have control over a bunch of other systems in your data center. So you could do configuration management, sort of you know, set up NTP, or you could schedule software installs, push out latest like, security patches and stuff. Um, and the add-on here was that in addition to sort of the, the standard stream of, of packages, uh, customers were able to create their own um, repositories and upload packages into them that they could then, you know, schedule for install. Right? Uh, pretty cool. So they could use this to like deploy their own code that they were then gonna run their e-commerce website on or something. So how it failed um, is that we built this as developers working on our own systems, working with our own, you know test packages, right? So we're dealing with like 10 kilobyte little packages, like probably reusing like tar or something all the time. And um, our customers are enterprise customers building enterprise code at the time, which meant enterprise Java, which meant hundreds of megabyte packages. So we're dealing with like orders of magnitude and difference in the amount of data that's to be transferred across the network instead of being local. So the customers are uploading things and it's taking longer than they expect and they're probably like doing batches of 10 or 20 and they're canceling the upload and then they're starting again and canceling and starting again and canceling. And the first setup for this was just writing these files to disk and for fortunately we weren't buffering them all in memory first, but this meant we were like writing out partial files and filling up the disks and then getting support calls. So, you know, how we fix it is with chunk transfers, right? So instead of trying to send everything at once, we sent little sort of pre-sized pieces up at once and add an API for the client to ask the server what it already had so that we could resume these uploads. You know, pretty simple solution, and had we been developing with the uh, needs of the user in mind to start with, we would have, you know, began this way. So the lesson here is to anticipate your users' needs, like what they're actually going to do uh, and what they will need to do with your system and how this interacts with the, you know, the rest of the world, right? So we can't rely on the user to do the same thing we do, and we can't rely on the network that they're using to be the same as the one that we're developing with. So uh, next, collaborative editing. Uh, so this was a system that had this sort of real-time backend as a service, uh, like similar to like Firebase, uh, with built-in identity and access controls. You could log in and own your own little bits of this uh, sort of shared tree-based data structure. Uh, and the concept here was that users would be able to come on to a... So we provided this service developers wrote applications on top of it, and then users could use these applications to come and do things, you know, work together and edit a text document or have real-time chat, things like this. Uh, and how it failed was that, while well, we were building a system to allow multiple people to edit the same thing at once without having a way to resolve conflicts in these things. So, you'd have a contentious resource and have the, the users behind the developer's application always sort of overriding each other's changes. So this was something that sort of, you know, happened very early, like day two or whatever of developing, like, oh yeah, this is probably something that we need to handle. Um, 
And then it became a, uh, a fun exercise in looking at all the wonderful options that we had available to us to deal with uh, this sort of stampede of changes and synchronizing state between systems, both on client and up to the server, dealing with latency and offline editing and stuff. So, you know, we have classic pessimistic locking where the user would take a lock on a resource and then no one else could touch it while they made their changes. And that would have been disastrous because we're dealing with untrustable clients. So someone could have just locked this data and held on to it forever and, you know, DOSed the, the application. Uh, optimistic locking where you assume that you have the lock, you make a change based on reporting that you assume that the state is here or the, or the version is at this point. And then if it's not, you know, you get a, an error response back. Uh, operational transformation, which is something that like Google Docs does, right? Where you've got, it's very sort of useful for text. Instead of talking about um, either replacing the text absolutely or inserting like at position seven, you would say insert text at position seven, given that the state was at this point, and then your server is able to say, all right, well, since you've said that, someone else has actually deleted three characters, so now you're at position four. So this way you can write, like, if you have hello, and you write world, and someone else changes hello to hi, it sort of all reconciles up. And then these crazy uh, conflict-free replicated data types, commutative and convergent. Um, commutative data types are, like, Pretty simply, you could just say that if you want to have a number and you want to change 12 to 13, you just report that you add one. You know, and the server knows to add one. Um, and then convergent types are really taking two different data structures and having logic that says how they should resolve. Uh, so it's very application dependent. And in our case, where we're building, we're building an API that then other developers build applications on top of we have no concept of what their schema might be. So while it was super neat and, um, and very complicated, which, you know, as developers we enjoy dealing with, it didn't make sense in this case. Um, so in the end, you know, the, the trick is here is to look at the common use cases and, and just put a solution that's good enough in place for those. So if we're looking at wanting to support real-time chat, where you're just dealing sort of with a list of, of responses, then having an append operation on that is good enough, right? Um, even if you append and then someone else comes in before you and their chat message sort of appears above yours, that's okay. Um, and then optimistic locking, uh, which allowed for us to let the developers implement the logic that they needed to resolve any conflicts. Um, so in that way, they're able to write in their own application code a, a, the method to resolve things without us needing to sort of get in there and have anything running on the server. Um, so yeah, so what we would have done had this project continue is built all those really cool things and then bolt them on as like add-on features. Um, because we couldn't just change the semantics of how this system worked, like out from under developers. Right? That would have been bad to sort of break that API contract. We would have been the unreliable ones in that case. Uh, yeah, so the, the lesson here, and something that really can apply to more than, to any, you know, API, is uh, if it's something that's going to be highly contentious, then you can offer conditional updates for it. So if you've got an API that's like tracking you know, movies that you want to watch with your family and you expect that two people might go and, and change this list at the same time, then you can add a flag, you know, track a version in the, uh, in the data and add a, an, a parameter that will actually say that the, the revision that you want to modify is this one. And if it's not, you get an error back. But, you know, you don't need this on something like editing a user's profile where they're probably going to be the only person changing their own information. Oh, purchases. So this is, you know, the current company manifold, right? We're selling things. And 
uh, having an API where any time you call this API means that you're spending money. Um, we want to make sure that when you call this API, you spend what you think you're spending. Uh, it would be pretty bad for someone to purchase a database and then not find out until the end of the month that they paid, were paying twice that they expected and they had some orphan database sitting around somewhere that they hadn't used. So the great thing is, right, it didn't fail um, until it did, <laughs> right? So uh, we built the API and we were like, great, this is, this is not going to fail. And then we added a new endpoint, um, a better endpoint, except it wasn't better in a, uh, a certain case where um, if there was a failure sort of while this was being called and the client was set up to do retries, it would try again and, you know, spend more money and then come back sort of with that latest response. Uh, so not, not great. Um, we caught it, which is good, before anyone spent extra money. So um, I guess the one thing about how we fix this is that I, I can't say how you would fix this sort of in, at the meta level. Like, how do you stop this from ever happening again, right? Because we had a working solution in place, and then we added a new change, and we, you know, sort of broke it. Um, so this is the kind of thing where you have to get creative, and maybe you can do static analysis uh, on some, some of your endpoints, depending on how you describe your API. Uh, but anyways, um, the point here is that uh, you know, we have an, an API exposed that the browser or some other API consumer speaks to. Um, and behind that API, all kinds of things happen. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that what the user is asking for exists and then see if they actually have a credit card on file and then charge them for it and then talk to the third party to start provisioning this database. And we want to make sure that these things happen um, only once. But the API itself should be simple. And so, uh, you know, the way to do this is just sort of to have this idempotent API where the client can retry the same thing, and if it actually succeeded the first time, then you know, they, their second call won't say, oh, you failed because it already exists. It'll say, cool, yeah, no, you've asked that this thing exist, and it does exist. Uh, or if that first call reported that it errored, but something was sort of already in process, then the next call, if you have your item potency sort of continue down the chain, will um, eventually achieve the same result. So this is like put versus post, right? A, a put call then tends to be that you say, create this data at this, like at this URL, and you just sort of want it to exist there. So even if you call it repeatedly with the same value, you know, most APIs will, will sort of just say, great, it's there. Um, whereas a post, you're always ex like implicitly saying, make me something new. So this is, comes down to um, the delivery semantics and then guarantees. Do you want something to be at least once or do you want it to be at most once? And for the case of a purchase, we want it to be at most once, right? We want to, if you ask for something, we want it to either exist or have an error come back that doesn't, or that says it wasn't made. You know, or if we're unable to report it and the user or the consumer of the API is sort of like, what's going on? It's better to err on the side of caution and not spend their money. Uh, but in other cases, at least once might be the better option. Like if you're doing analytics and you want to know that a user has logged in, you probably, you know, you, you may wish to ensure that you always get that, that uh, message. And so you can deliver it, you know, having it show up twice in your event stream is okay, because you can just deduplicate later. So you know, pick your delivery guarantees, right? It depends on the, um, the resource that you're manipulating and sort of the business case that you're dealing with. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is um, coordinating responses. So this is something that just like continues to come up, right? I'm not going to give a specific example here, 
but just any system that has sort of a, you know, services and now microservices, and then some kind of aggregation layer or gateway sort of bringing things back together. So if we're thinking about like a, you know, movies, right, and you've got the movie itself and it's made by a studio and it has actors in it and maybe you've just got IDs in this sort of movie service that talk about a studio and then there's a studio service that has these, uh, the info for these uh, studios, you know, linked to the IDs. Um, you may have at some level uh, an aggregation API that pulls it together and sort of inlines the, um, the studio's name into the, the movie response. So how this fails, right, is that if we're doing this and aggregating things together, then we've taken our, um, our sort of microservice architecture where we're trying to like isolate change, move faster, and, and sort of build in some resiliency, and we're actually doing the opposite. A single response is now communicating with n different services, and we have you know, n different chances for this thing to blow up on us. Um, and that's sort of the way that you're going to go and, and write your code to start with. You're going to say, like, call through all these APIs and say, oh, if it errors, just return an error. So a few ways that we sort of fix this. Um, it really comes down to the API and the data that you're dealing with, right? Uh, in some cases, denormalization makes the most sense. So you may just include the studio name in the movie and then have some other process that'll like periodically reconcile. So you end up with eventual consistency, right? You're okay with having a response for this movie that says that the studio was like universal um, when it actually should have been some other studio and just having eventually the result come back to the right name when someone updates it. Um, you know, but in other cases, this is actually a benefit. So for the, the purchasing service that we have now, uh, when a user buys a subscription, we want to track the state of that subscription at the time of purchase. So we record how much they should be paying monthly. And then if a uh, provider comes and changes the cost of something, we don't automatically change how much everybody's paying uh, because that's not the contract that they had, right? So there has to be some sort of considered change that then goes through and updates existing users, you know, who may have been like grandfathered in. Uh, and then another option is sort of this, this graceful degradation idea, uh, where if you have a, a UI, you know, that has like, like on Twitter, the follower count, uh, if, if you're not able to contact the follower service, you can just leave out that whole block. You know, get rid of the numbers and get rid of the text, and it's just a, an empty space, and most people won't notice or care. Uh, so in the same way, your API can do the same, right? You can have some value that's, you know, in your schema is optional and just admit it if you don't have it. But this, you know, this makes the API pretty leaky, right, to the fact that there's different services behind it. Um, and so it's, it's great maybe for a private API backing a, like your website, but if you're exposing it to users, having some API that you call two times in a row and gives you, you know, one time this field is filled in and the other it's not would be uh, pretty weird. So, you know, the idea here is to try and tolerate service failure. So what are the dependencies of, of one service and how can you ensure that, um, that if they're, they're not accessible, you know, you can still return a result where it makes sense. Cool. Um, so yeah, just to, to recap here, you know, you want to anticipate the user's needs. Uh, if you've got contentious resources, consider using conditional updates. Uh, pick your delivery guarantees and uh, tolerate service failure. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Cool. I guess we can do some questions if there's any. No? All right. Thanks, everybody.